Welcome to In Focus. In this edition, I'd like to share with you a conversation that I had recently with an amazing man, Dr. Daniel Estulin. Some of you are familiar with his work. If you're not, let me tell you a little bit about Daniel, why we had this conversation, and I think what you see next will have even deeper meaning for you. Daniel Estulin, uh, he's many things. He is a journalist. He's an investigative uh, journalist. He's an author. He is an expert on geopolitics, and through a mutual friend, it is that expertise that initially brought us together to talk about what's happening in the world, what's driving the changes, where we feel those changes may be leading, what those changes mean for us in, in our lives. He's the author of, uh, of a number of books, best-selling books, 48 languages, now in 68 countries. He's reaching a lot of people, and it's through those books and his insights that, uh, not surprisingly, he was a 2015 nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize, the Nobel Prize in, in Peace. One of his most recent books, I love this title, Trans Evolution, The Coming Age of Human Deconstruction. And this is obviously about the, the movement that I've talked about in many of my videos as well, and some of my books, the movement to replace our natural biology with synthetics, computer chips in the brain, uh, chemicals in the blood, sensors under the skin. The transhuman movement is kind of the umbrella that uh, many of these ideas fall under commonly. And that was the basis of the, the conversation that, uh, that I'm going to share with you now. It's about an hour long. And if you're not familiar with Daniel's work, you'd like to know more about it, please check the link below in, uh, in the comment section in this video. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as we had sharing it together. It was completely unscripted. We didn't know where it was going to go or even how long it was going to take. Uh, we ended up stopping at one hour and agreed to call this Greg and Daniel part one, and uh, we will have a part two within the next couple of weeks. So without further ado, please enjoy the, the conversation that I had with Dr. Daniel Estulin. Uh, Daniel, it is an honor to be with you. I have followed your work. I am a huge fan of your work behind the scenes. We have a mutual friend that's uh, that's put us together for the first time. Yep. This is completely unscripted. We don't know where this is going to go, and that's what makes it very exciting. Well, we know it's gonna it's gonna go well because you and I we know what we're talking about. We have a lot of common interests as far as knowledge is concerned, yeah. and uh, I think there's a lot to uh, to talk about. You know, the I think the the point of departure could be the point of transhumanism, something that you've researched for many many years and talked about in your documentaries and and films that i've watched many many times and guy amongst them many other platforms as well so let's start with that so what do you see like i mean where do you see that going because we can talk about what transhumanism is but today it has transmogrified itself in something well you know i don't want to call it unseemly but uh um there's a lot to discuss as far as the direction and what we're going to do with it and the fact that we have no language to really explain what's going to happen yeah, well, first, I'm I'm just going to begin by saying I, I'm a scientist. I'm a, a degree uh, geologist, a very strong background in math, physics, computer science, and uh, and I am a fan of technology. So I am not anti-technology at all. What I'm seeing happening, Daniel, is there is a movement, and I'm going to use that word intentionally. I believe it is a movement. Uh, it is it is intentional. It's happened for a couple of generations now where our young people are being conditioned to believe that uh, they are powerless victims of the world around them uh, and that the the very nature of being human of a carbon-based form of life we are flawed and among the flaws that are being taught to our young people they say the the ability for humans to have emotion is a flaw because it clouds our, our logic and our thinking and the ability, the way that we reproduce through physical intimacy is a flaw because it is, it is random, it's by chance, you never know what you're going to get. And so we're being taught that we are a flawed form of life uh, and that we are victims of our external circumstance. And if you're a victim, it means you need a savior. And the savior that's being touted is the savior of technology. So we are we are now at this crossroad, uh, a, a pivotal crossroad, where we are determining as a society and as individuals, how much of ourselves do we give away to the technology? 
Now, I'm, I'm very passionate about this for a couple of reasons. One of those reasons is there is a, a tenant in biology, Daniel, and I know you and, and your viewers have heard this. It's called use it or lose it. Right. And what, what that means in biology is that we we have these highly advanced biological systems, you know, the immune response and human metabolism and the way that memory and, and uh, neuron production, all these things, the way they work. If we begin to replace these natural abilities with synthetic uh, abilities, with computer chips, with artificial intelligence, chemicals in the blood, sensors under the skin, what happens is that our bodies believe those functions are no longer necessary and they begin to atrophy in one generation. And then the next generation, when we pass those characteristics on through what is called epigenetics, the epigenetic programming, Right. The next generation says, you know, maybe we don't need to do these anymore. This is exactly how you lose a species. This is how you lose the capabilities of a species. So our young people are being conditioned to worship the computer chip. Uh, and, and what they are not being told, and as a scientist, I find this fascinating, is computer chips are definitely fast they're definitely efficient and i'm a, a a computer chip guy i love i love the tech however computer chips and all of the ai and everything we're talking about it is limited by the physics of the material it is made of in other words the information is limited it can only pass so quick, quickly from from one atom to the next atom depending on if it's silicon or gold or you know whatever it is and this is where it gets really interesting, Daniel, is because what we're finding is we say, what is the upper limit of the human neuron? What is the upper limit of the, the, the cell membrane? And what the scientists are saying now is we do not know our own limits, because every time the human body, whether it's a single cell or it's a neural network uh, or it's a system in the body, when we approach what we believe is a limit, our bodies are conditioned and programmed to adapt and change and up level. We diagnose the problems and we fix, we heal those problems. And just for example, new brain states. But I was in school back in the 50s and 60s. And even now, young people are being taught that uh, the brain states uh, top out around 40, the, the speed of processing in the brain is about 40 hertz, 40 cycles per second. And now the Tibetan monks that are being studied at UCLA through the scanners are showing that under certain conditions, they exceed that. They can go to 80 cycles per second and then 100 cycles per second. So scientists said, okay, we made a mistake. Now we have to have a new brain state. And then the, the monks said, well, if we do... A, a different process will go beyond that. And so they had to come up with the gamma brain state and the hyper gamma brain state. And now the epsilon brain states, we do not know the upper limit of what it means to, to be a biological being. And we are in a generation, Daniel, where we're about to give our humanness away to the technology before we know what we're giving away. And this is, really this is my message. That's a really yeah. good point, because again, I think you'll agree that from the point of view of the elite, we're at war. We are at war with the elite. And for the first time in history of civilization, there is a technological opportunity to create, if we're the homo sapiens, let's call it homo mihoris, or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. How do you do this? With genome editing. So, so what's that? Well, gene editing is, is a group of, of technologies that give scientists the ability to change an organism's DNA, as you know. These technologies allow genetic material to be added, removed, or even altered at particular locations in general. Let me give you a simple example. Growing a baby outside the womb is known as ectogenesis. And uh, according to uh, papers, uh, scientific papers at the Deakin University study says, an artificial womb would need an outer shell or chamber. And that's somewhere to implant the embryo and protect it as it grows. And so the artificial womb will also need a synthetic replacement for amniotic fluid, a kind of a shock absorber in the womb during natural pregnancy. And finally, there will be a, a way to exchange the oxygen and the nutrients, in other words, oxygen and nutrients in, and carbon dioxide and, and waste products out. Mm -hmm. So the researchers would have to build an artificial placenta. And the uterus, again, it's, it's not a very complex organ. 
And so if you're the elite, you take an artificial uterus, you take an incubator, in the same way as if it were an incubator for chickens, and then you have artificial insemination, and we genetically shorten the gestation period, and you get as many of this whole mehors with limited cognitive abilities as you need. And today, technologically speaking, this can be done. And I think what most people don't understand is that we are losing, we the people, we're losing this war. Humanity is losing. And so I think what we, what we would need to learn from the elite to change the dynamics of the game, well, because they play a long game and we don't. You know, we plan weekend, maybe next weekend. At most, we plan somebody's wedding six months down the line. And these people plan hundreds of years in advance. For example, at the end of World yeah. War II, in 1945, while the Soviets were celebrating victory over the Nazi Germany, the financial elite that created their breadwoods economic system, that's today is on its deathbed, they were already preparing the dismantling of the Soviet Union 50 years later. They outdid themselves. It didn't take them 50 years. But they were out of that long. So I think, again, what's under assault are not only our individual human rights, but the very institution of the concept of nation-state republic from the oligarchy's massive social engineering product conducted through uh, Tavistock Institute for Human Relations and, 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 and others, much larger integrated networks of these uh, centers of applied social psychology and social engineering that emerged in the afterwards of, uh, aftermath of World War II. And these groups regard us, the people, and the principles of nation state as it's kind of an axiomatic philosophical enemy. In other words, we're talking about behavior modification. So let me ask you this, from the point of view of science, again, we could talk about transhumanism, human, transhuman, post-human. What is the purpose, do you think, of this behavior modification we're witnessing right now? You, you're, you're thinking exactly like I'm thinking, because that's where I was going to go next, because Everything you said, yes, everything you said, and those things are all happening. But ultimately, Daniel, we're we're in the middle of a battle. You know, there's a battle for our thoughts. That's very apparent. You yep. need look no further than the legacy media to see how it's called the, the fifth domain of, of warfare, how we're being programmed, our beliefs. There's a battle for what we believe about ourselves, about our origin. Are we the product of random mutations or... Uh, and lucky biology, or is there some intentionality? There's there's a battle for the, the way that we believe our universe even began. Is it random physics, or is there some causation underlying that? All those are happening, and everything that you're saying, Daniel, is happening. Ultimately, I believe they are all distractions from a deeper battle, and it's a deep and ancient battle that has been playing out for a very, very long time. It's a battle for our very humanness and even, even beyond that. And I'm going to use a word and then I'll define that word. There is an aspect of our humanness that is called divinity. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people associate divinity with religion. It has nothing to do with religion. If you look at the definition of divinity, it's really interesting. Divinity is defined as the ability to transcend perceived human limitations the ability to become more than the limits we have placed upon ourselves and ultimately i think this is the answer to your question it is a battle for our divinity because it is our divinity that frees us from the shackles and the bonds of the fear that keeps the human population enslaved through all of the methods you're talking about bretton woods and you know, everything else, the the wars that are being fought, uh, the intentional effort to break the bonds of our society, rich against poor, men against women, black against whites, Christians against Muslim, adults against children, and it goes on and on. All of that, all of that is ultimately designed to steal from us our very divinity, because when we have our divinity then we exercise the full potential of what it means to be human, the extraordinary abilities to self-regulate the human body, to self-regulate our immune system, to self-regulate longevity enzymes, to, to uh, self-regulate our ability to, uh, to create greater heart rate variability, which makes change easier for us. 
super learning, super memory, super cognition, all of this is only available through what we call our, our divinity, our creativity, our intuition, our imagination, AI, computer chips, chemicals in the blood do not have imagination. So when, when we give our divinity away, we are vulnerable to other people's ideas and other agendas of what our world should look like and what our lives should look like. I believe, to answer your question, this is the ultimate battle that we are fighting for our humanness, our divinity. And DNA is, is the key. When we replace the DNA with synthetic polymers uh, and you know all of the, the things that are being proposed right now, the DNA literally, it literally is a biological antenna that allows us to access uh, intelligence that we're only beginning to understand through the best science of the modern world. So now I'm not saying that every every politician knows this. Most of them don't. Absolutely. They're, Absolutely. They're, they're, they're pawns in a game. But ultimately, those at the top playing this game, humans can only be subject to control if they lose their divinity. And I think that's the battle of, of our generation. And, and, and most people don't even know it. I also think if you ask ourselves, so what are they doing really? Like if you ask the question so, um, of the elite, well, they're bringing about forced change to our way of life right. without our agreeing and without ever realizing what's happening to us. As you said, most politicians, 99.999% have no idea that this is being done. No. And the ultimate goal, of course, the complete extirpation of the mankind's inner sense of identity, the tearing out of mankind's innermost soul, you're speaking of the divine. It's a divine spark of reason. And the placement in this vacant space that they've created uh, of an artificial synthetic pseudo soul. But to do this, in order to change mankind's behavior away from industrial production into all kinds of you know pseudo things, and bring us willfully into this world of post-industrial era of zero growth, zero progress, Satanism, trans-industrial sixth technological paradigm. One must force first a change in mankind's self-image. Also, it's fundamental conception of what we are. And so the image of man appropriate to that new era must be sought out, synthesized, obviously, speaking Spanish, and then wired into our brain. And of course, over time, that's how we will become whatever, from Homo sapiens to Homo mejores. But by breaking the very basic value system, they extirpate the human being from this world, or no? Yeah, no, I, I, I see that. I see that happening. And, and what is the insidious thing that's happening now, Daniel, is in the old days, the attempt was to impose these things upon society. But that doesn't work because people will push back. So now what is happening of course it doesn't work it never no, works. no so so what's happening now is the ideas are being implemented through skewed and distorted algorithms in our social media through regulation of uh you know legacy news media to lead people into a way of thinking that supports the agenda that is being imposed. So people are actually making the choices that are destroying their own lives and their own society. It's uh, I'm I know it's happening, and I'm still amazed as I watch it because it is so efficient, and it is it is happening. Uh, it is working so well. It is actually working very well. And also knowing that, you know, the, someone asked me recently in an interview, "How do we win this battle?" And my sense from studying with the indigenous people all over the world and reading the ancient texts. I don't think you'll ever fight. I, I don't think you win the battle by fighting back. You win the battle by becoming the best version of yourself. When we awaken all of our potential, when we live what it means to be human, we've already won the battle. And Buckminster Fuller, I think, maybe said this best. He said, You're, you'll never change the world by fighting against the things you don't like. Now we all know sometimes we have to fight. We all know that. But he said, if you want, if you want to change the world, he said, find a better way to do the things that you want to do. And the old ways will collapse. And I believe there's a lot of truth to that. So I think when we 
if we get caught up in the hate and the anger and the fear of what we don't want, Daniel, that's very different than living the life that we choose out of love. We love, we love to create beautiful things. We love to to have a strong family. You know, we love to have a strong society. That's very different than riding in the street and burning down buildings and turning over cars because you're angry. So you mentioned. Yeah, so by so the way that we win is we live our divinity, our ability to transcend perceived limitations. And, and this is so interesting because even in the definition, the ability to transcend it becomes it means to become more than the limitations that you perceive. They may not even be real limitations. They're limitations that are perceived, that have been programmed. We've been programmed to think that we are powerless, limited victims of our environment. So it's it's a fascinating time. And I I am seeing this happen so quickly, Daniel. It, I don't think it will drag on for another generation. Running, we, no, yeah, running, we're, we're at a crossroad right now. Something's got to give. Something's got to give. Time. You mentioned yeah. something which is absolutely true. I, I mean, the the whole idea of, of physical slavery, okay, colonization, physical slavery, force, brute force, that has been replaced by technological slavery. And again, in the past, it was done via military aggression. Today, you don't need to do that via military aggression. You do it with advanced technologies. Let me give you a simple example. Internet. What's internet? It's a digital gulag under the control of Big Brother within the confines of this permanent hybrid war. My internet is not working. Oh, my God. How am I going to survive the rest of the day? And they live very comfortably and very happily within the confines of this make-believe world. And the collective degradation that we experience in society is, is palpable. So a world where physics and mathematics are considered racist subjects invented by a white race. Yeah. yeah. And if you tell and if you tell people that everything they need to know is available for free in Wikipedia, or that there is no need to study, that you can use use, use chat uh, GPT to get you any information you want to write any paper you want. <laughs> And that everything is an internet, then two plus two becomes 22. And that whoever tells you two plus two is four is a racist. And the next step, we're building a society absolutely dependent on concentration camp technology to survive. And what I was saying, again, what you and I were discussing in the beginning about this move from uh, humanism to transhumanism. Okay. We are living in a world of meta systems. Now, if I cut off your access to internet, most of these people will not be able to survive because they're empty vessels. Mm -hmm. The brain is an empty, clueless vessel. That's one thing. And the second thing, yeah. okay, has to do with human cognition. How do you think, Greg, human cognition fits into this global plan of control? Well, this is this is the point, that the, the cognition is part of the divinity. When we talk about divinity, uh, when I'm not doing what I'm doing now, uh, I'm a musician, my wife is a musician, and we spend a lot of time with amazing musicians. And if you ask a musician, we were, uh, my wife was just at the Grammys, for example, earlier this year, and she would ask musicians, where did that amazing piece of music come from? Every one of them, every one to the T will say, it didn't come from me, it came through me from somewhere else. That is our divinity, it's our creativity, it's our imagination. That, uh, that allows us to express in, in these ways. And cognition, all of our cognition is, is part of that. So what scientists are finding now, and I'll give you a perfect example. The, it, we are almost at a generation now where artificial AI visor uh, is now available. They've been available commercially to young people. So here's what they're finding. This is what the peer-reviewed scientific studies are showing. Young kids, maybe three years old, four years old, they wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, their parents place them in the living room. They put an AI visor and the kids sit there for hours and hours and hours. And in that AI visor, they are seeing things that they would never see in the real world. They're seeing situations. They are having an intensity of sound and of colors that makes going into the backyard, playing with their friends seem boring because they're, they're seeing these. So now, now that this has been happening for a few years, scientists are doing the studies. And what they're finding is that cognition is being damaged from kids 
using these AI advisors, uh, you know, for extended periods of time. And here's the reason, because they are watching they are observing all of these things happening. They're not using their imagination. Right. They're not using their creativity. The AI is doing it for them. So there is a, a thickening in the brain, literally, the tissue and the visual cortex is thickening, but there is a degradation in other parts of, of the brain as well as social skills, interpersonal communication, emotional development, even the size of, uh, of the brain development. So we're already beginning to see uh, how physiology is changing, can change in response to to the technology. And I just want to say, you know, for our, our listeners out there, again, I'm, I'm not against technology. Uh, it's not good, bad, right or wrong. It's how we apply it and the thinking underlying the technology. Because we already use transhumanism. You know, you get a hip transplant. That is a form of transhumanism or contact lenses in your eyes or, or whatever. And, and I think that's fine. We're talking about replacing large portions of uniquely human capabilities with synthetics, like putting a computer chip into the brain uh, so that parts of the brain are, are no longer thinking and, and creating those neurons or chemicals in the blood that mimic the immune response that the body already has. And if those chemicals mimic that immune response over a long periods of time, the body, its own immune re response is compromised. And, and we know this, we know this from peer reviewed studies. So I'm, I'm not saying don't use technology. I wanna be really clear with our, our viewers. I think we're talking about, yeah, you and I are talking about something else. It's one thing, you know, we don't wanna be living in the stone age, but the idea is that the, the idea of the elite of what transhumanism is and how we understand it in a good sense of the word are two different worlds. Because again, what's if you're thinking about what is transhumanism? Because again, people often, you know, imagine the term if you ask anyone, well, they think of Terminator, Rise of the Machine, Hollywood films, yeah. I roll, but and other many Hollywood films as an image of transhumanism. But is this what they lead are working towards? Because that's the question. Because transhumanism is really, if you think about it from their point of view is this ultra high tech dream of computer scientists and philosophers and et cetera, et cetera. It seeks to use this um, radical advances in technology to augment the human body, mind, and ultimately the entire human experience. It is the philosophy that uh, supports the idea that mankind should proactively enhance itself and steer the course of its own evolution. Well, and it all it all comes from the assumption that we are flawed to begin with. But so just to be be clear with our viewers, if if some of you maybe um, have heard of transhumanism and are not so familiar, there, there are actually three levels of transhumanism, and we're engaged in two of those levels right now. So first level is what we just talked about. If you replace a knee or a hip or you know contact lenses, you're using technology to enhance the human experience. That's that's level one. Level two is where we begin to replace parts of the body with synthetics. And I'm not against this either. I mean, we today, Daniel, we have the technology. We can 3D print uh, a kidney to to replace a failing kidney. I think you we can pretty much 3D print that entire body. Well, exactly. right, or right now, they're, yeah. they're 3D printing kidneys, hearts, and um, and the epidermis, so skin tissue for, for burn victims. And that's a beautiful thing to help people that need that. Uh, to to a limited degree. The third phase is the one that I think is the, the stuff that the science fiction is made of, is where the thinking, and, and I've talked to some of these, these researchers, they believe that human consciousness is limited to ones and zeros and pluses and minuses, and can be, can be that our personality, our consciousness can be confined to a computer chip. And if we are confined to a computer chip, then we become immortal. Because when one body breaks, you download the information into another body, a robot or another human. Ultimately, I think they're afraid of, of their own mortality. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, who is a, an innovator, uh, you know, he's a, a tech guy. I think he's he's director of engineering at Google in one of exactly. the, the AI, AI firms or, or departments. Uh, and he's he's a real technologically oriented guy. So I'm not saying he's a bad man. I'm not saying that. But he very casually says, by the year 2035, we will be a hybrid species. There will be no yeah. 
no no pure humans. But then this is so interesting. I was watching an interview and they asked them and they said, well, what does that mean for society? What does that mean, you know, for our children in our everyday lives? And his answer was so typical. Daniel, he, he, he essentially said, don't ask me. He said, I'm just the scientist. I'm going to push the tech as far and as fast as I can. The, the social implications, that's for somebody else to figure out. So he's he's just having a great time developing new tech. But the social implications, and we're seeing this with the AI right now and, and everything that's happening with uh, AI in our lives. If you look at the constant breakthrough, speaking of social implications in technology, uh, uh, which makes the transhumanist vision of a very real possibility for the near future. For example, uh, you mentioned neurochips, neurochip interfaces, computer chips that connect directly to the brain are being developed as we speak. And yeah. the ultimate goal of this brain chip will be to do what? To increase intelligence thousands of times over, basically turning our human brain into the supercomputer. So you have lifelong uh, emotional well-being is also a key concept with uh, within transhumanist movement. And they're saying that this can be achieved, Harari is talking about this, through a recalibration of the pleasure centers in the brain. In mm -hmm. other words, pharmaceutical uh, uh, mood renders have been suggested, which will be cleaner and safer than the mind-altering drugs. As, again, Harari. And this is uh, Huxley's 21st uh, century scientific dictatorship without tears. In other words, the era of the world controllers. And as Huxley said, there seemed to be no good reason why a thoroughly scientific dictatorship should ever be overthrown. And of course, the yeah. the goal is to replace all the you know aversive experiences with pleasure beyond the doubts of a normal human experience. Nanotechnology, what well, we know about that, that's a pivotal area uh, as far as the transhumanists is, are concerned. And so the size of creating machines, which are the size of, of molecules, and again, they're talking about Global Futures 2045 International Congress. That's their project. That's their vision. You mentioned uh, 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 Kurzweil. Well, he's talking about singularity, which is uh, uh, technology and biology together. And singularity, according to them, would occur at a point in which artificial intelligence surpasses the capability of the human brain. And so we're going to have from cyborgs with very long lifespans uh, to downloading consciousness, as you mentioned, into the machine. Transhumanists say that it is impossible to predict exactly what this post-human will be like, but according to them, it will be better. So my question is, do we want to be an immortal transhumans or mortal humans? Well, this is where the this is one of those beautiful places where the wisdom of our ancestors, the best science of the modern world, and uh, and the technology that we have today come together in, in a really a really powerful way. So I'm uh, I am a multidisciplinary scientist, and it allows me I say that because it allows me to stay current with new discoveries in many many different sciences. And one of the things that's not being talked about, Daniel, but the, the scientists are, are pretty much on board with this, is that we now know that modern we, we are called anatomically modern human, AMH. Uh, and we know that we showed up on Earth about 200,000 years before present, 200,000 years ago. Scientists agree on that. The controversy is how did we get here? The old story was random evolution, random mutations, and Darwin's idea of evolution. The problem is that new studies in genetics through DNA studies, we now can extract the DNA from the fossilized remains of the beings that we used to think were our ancestors, the ones that we came from. And now that we have done that, we see that we did not descend from these earlier forms of life. We didn't descend from Neanderthal, for example. Uh, and the genome from our earliest ancestors 200,000 years ago and our genome, it's exactly the same. We have not changed in 200,000 years. Now, when they look at specific chromosomes, human chromosome number two is a big mystery because it is the result of the fusion of two pre-existing chromosomes. And I, most of our, our viewers know that on the ends of the chromosomes are the telomeres that uh, protect the chromosome when it splits uh, as the cell divides. Those telomeres are always supposed to be on the ends of the chromosomes. Human chromosome number two 
They're on one end and on the other end, and they're also in the middle because the chromosome is the result of that fusion. After the fusion happened, there were genes that were added, genes that were taken away, genes that were silenced, and it happened exactly 200,000 years ago when we emerged. And if that was the only chromosome that had those kinds of mutations, you could say, well, you know, it's, it's unusual, but maybe it's lucky, but it's not. Human chromosome number seven underwent a rare mutation that allows us to, to have complex speech and allows us to sing, uh, connecting our tongue and our jaw and our brain. So the point is that we know that we are not the product of random processes uh, evolving slowly and gradually over a long period of time. Something happened, something mysterious happened 200,000 years ago. The science knows that. They're, the controversy is what, what happened, but they know something happened. And we were given the abilities that we're only beginning to understand now. So the question is, do we believe that we know more than who or what is responsible for us being here? My sense is we know just enough to tweak that biology, but we do not know the long-term implications. And that's why I, I personally believe we owe it to ourselves uh, to know who we are. What does it mean to be human? And what is our potential before we give it away to the technology? And, and what I'm seeing happening right now, I'm seeing two parallel societies. Daniel, there's one, one element of our society that's all in on all the tech. I mean, they're, they're in, you know, give, give me a chip in the brain and, you know, whatever. And then there's another element of our society. I, I live in a rural area in northern New Mexico, and I go to my little co-op to buy my fresh vegetables and, and my groceries. And this is where I get to see my neighbors. They don't know what the stuff you and I are talking about. They don't talk about this stuff. But what they do know is this. They said something is wrong in the world. The world is moving too fast. We are losing the values that we cherish as individuals in the society. We need to go back to the basics. And so they're, they're not going to go in on the technology. They're growing their own food. They're taking their kids out of school. They're growing their own business. They're not plugged into the global economy. It's a local economy. So I'm seeing two parallel societies at the same time. And I think what's going to happen, Daniel, is what humans do is we're going to check each other out and we're going to say who's happier, who's healthier, whose lives are more fulfilled, who has more creativity and imagination, who are the best artists, who are the best musicians. And I think that's the way we're going to go. And I think realistically, it will probably be some middle ground. I think we'll accept some of the technology, but we're going to keep the elements of, of our humanness. I think that ultimately is uh, is where our society is going to go. And, and I think it'll be very polarized. I think there's going to be a, a technological element that's going to look like those cyborgs you see in, um, you know, in science fiction. And then there's going to be the pure humans. And even now, Daniel, you know, there's a call in some countries, Latin countries, for blood from people who have never ex ex accepted some of the technological interventions that we have been offered or required over the last few years, that blood is becoming more and more valuable. And the human birth rate is declining. Very Fertility on a global basis is declining. So the ability to conceive and the natural human biology and human blood is now becoming recognized as more and more precious. You mentioned uh, Hollywood and, and, and the films and, and parallel worlds. Well, transhumanists, they, they have big plans for humanity. And their star-studded project is called Project Avatar. Okay, human-like robots controlled via brain-computer interfaces, supported and financed by what? The U.S. Department of Defense via DARPA, via NASA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what's fascinating... Greg, is that uh, David Cameron, the uh, director of Titanic, Avatar, his futuristic film, Avatar, and now a real uh, uh, world, they're almost identical. And so if you start looking at the elite plans and the, and, and, and the film's storyline, they're too, uh, too similar to be uh, coincidental, for example. Did you see the film Avatar? I have, yes. 
Okay, the, the, again, for, for those who might not have seen it, uh, the film begins in the year 2154, Pandora, okay? Think of the name, Pandora. is run by this corporate elite on top of the world, okay? That's the, the, the one world government. Okay, this is not a free market enterprise, but total monopoly. Now, Earth has been mined, you know, to depletion, and natural world destroyed, and the ruling elite won't hesitate to do the same with other worlds. And so to facilitate their planned exploitation of Pandora, a scientific elite works under the occupying military force, which in turn uh, serves the mega corporations of financing the mission. And so these towering 10-foot blue avatars are the result of individual human DNA fused to Pandora's humanoid DNA. They are called Nabis. And once this hybrid body has been grown in a tank, what we just talked about before, okay, uh, the team can transfer an individual's consciousness into these avatars, retaining the person's full identity. Are they telling us what they're going to do to us and we're just too stupid or too blind to see it? You, you know, there is, um, I, I, first, I love the movie Avatar, and it illustrates a principle that now has become a philosophy in some scientific circles. And so the philosophy goes like this, that consciousness informs itself through the things that it creates. So what we think is um, uh, entertainment, it might be entertainment, but it also is our consciousness creating through books and music and sculpture and dance and movies, what it is that we are asking ourselves to remember about ourselves. So if you take this concept, and you look at some of the big, especially science fiction movies, Matrix, for example, the first Matrix. Yeah. Now, it, you know, there was Hollywood shoot them up and, and they had to do that. But but the theme of the Matrix is that there's a world that we cannot see that influences the world that we can see and that we exist in both of those <laughs> worlds. That's exactly what science is telling us right now. And you look at uh, the film Inception about yeah, our a, ability to film. yeah yeah well, it's a very deep film our ability to dream within dream within dream and to actually interact with one another and have business deals that's what happened in the movie they would go into the dream state seal the business deal and then they'd walk into the boardroom and it was a done deal but the people around them had no idea you know what that's just the happened. film with leonardo DiCaprio. in case people yeah yeah he was in that and then and then you look at the, at the films that the young people are being drawn to now they're all about superpowers you know wonder woman and the avengers about dormant powers in the human body so when we see all of these we have to say if consciousness informs itself through the things it creates what are we asking ourselves to remember through our entertainment through our movies when you look at avatar i think it's right on i think you nailed it and uh and i think that the matrix a dear friend, a colleague of mine, Dr. Bruce Lipton, uh, we were touring Europe uh, in a train the year that uh, that the, the Matrix came out. And we were talking about the movie. And he said to me, he said, you know, people think it's science fiction. He said, but it's actually a documentary. And I, I had to think about that. But he said, the Matrix is a documentary. Yeah, it's point. telling us about our relationship to the field. So I, I think I do. I, I think there's a lot of truth. But you no, know, so let me ask you this. Let me ask you sure. this because again, one of the things, uh, if we're talking about matrix, we're talking about the elite. Uh, what are the elite afraid of today? You know, I um, well, I was going to ask you something very similar. Of what I was going to ask you was the conversation we're having is not occurring within a vacuum. There are many things happening in the round. There's disclosure that is happening on whatever level you believe is authentic. There is the climate change narrative and, and the geoengineering of our planet. There is the, the buckling and the collapse of a global financial system and the, the, the economic system that it's part of that. So, so this conversation of, of our transhumanism, it's not in a vacuum. All of these things are happening. And when they resonate. Ask, they they yeah. they have. Let me so let me answer that then the yeah. question, and then I want I want to see what you think. Uh, uh, what are they afraid of? Or how? Let, let me let me ask a rhetorical question. How does the world work from a historical vantage point? Because what they're afraid of now, we've seen this before, is just 
we the people don't know our history. What's the ideology of the Western world? Well, at first we had slave owners and there were fewer numbers and all the others were slaves. And so this modus operandi did not obviously resist the, te the, the test of time. And eventually the Roman Empire, okay, gave way to the feudal order. We're talking about between the fourth and the sixth century. And then the slave owners were forced to do what? To share some things with the former slaves. And this system, well, it could not resist the test of time either. And so feudalism gave way to modern capitalism, where each ex-slave bought a small car, a small house, a vacation, two weeks a year, in Disneyland or wherever the hell they go. Why? For the simple reason that slaves were physiologically the same people as patricians, the slave owners. Mm -hmm. And so first of all, they... They multiplied without any control. Second of all, they, the slaves, we, the people, the great unwashed, as Kissinger and Rockefeller calls us, we needed to eat three times a day, every single day. And third, we developed consciousness and self-awareness. And so as a result, you had appeared again and again and again Spartacus, who wanted to become a slave owner. And so the system changed again and again. And therefore, the elite had this dream of creating a new subspecies who possessed a limited cognitive capacity and who can easily be reproduced in a synthetic a cheap way, what we're talking about before, the incubators, etc. And today, it's more than doable with transhumanism, with technologies, with the sixth technological paradigm, with a shift towards this new world. We've gone from industrial to post-industrial to trans-industrial which is artificial intelligence, robotics, virtual world, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we're at right now. And so for the elite, their problem is, they actually, it's called Greek paradox. To go to a higher level of, of advancement, in te technologically speaking, you need to dismantle everything which was built before. And that's why we're seeing the dismantlement of society, the industrial, the post-industrial world need to be destroyed for them to have their trans-industrial society of the future. And so we're at the point of this clash, as you said, two different, who are we? You know, two different parallel worlds. Are we people, homo sapiens, or we're a different species? And a good reference, uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Matrix, the film. And, 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 and again, we're talking about which level of consciousness are we in? And how is that going to affect the future? So let me ask you, what do you think? What, what, do, you, what do you think the elite are afraid of? I think they are afraid of our divinity. I think I, I'm, when we talk about the elite, there are levels of elite. And some of those elite are pawns playing a game. talking about presidents and prime ministers. These no, people yeah. are nothing. Yeah, yeah. So the, they are pawns and there are, are different levels. Yes, there's a financial game. Yes, there's a power game. And all those I acknowledge. But on a deeply spiritual level, this is an ancient battle between light and dark, good and evil. I believe, and the way uh, it is our divinity that allows us to love. A computer chip cannot love. Uh, AI cannot love. It can mimic the love of the algorithm that it's given, but it cannot love. It cannot imagine. It can assemble bits and pieces of information, but it is not creating something. It's not drawing. This is where the science is breaking down because we, modern science, has yet to acknowledge the truth of how our consciousness even exists. They're searching, Brian Green, I just saw a video with Brian Green. He believes consciousness is a phenomenon that results from the interplay of electrons and quantum particles uh, in, in the neurons. He thinks consciousness is in the brain. Uh, when clearly, the, the science shows us that the brain is, and the neurons are antenna, biological antenna that tune us to something that is not in the brain. And that something is where our divinity comes from, our imagination, our creativity, uh, you know, the, uh, our appreciation for beauty, thing, things but like how that. Would you define, how would you define divinity? I, I did that early on. It's that the definite, and this comes right out of the dictionary. Divinity is the ability to transcend perceived human limitations. So <laughs> it is the ability to become the best version of ourselves. If, if it's only possible through DNA, tuning into that, if we're replacing DNA with synthetics, we lose that access. And, and that's how we lose our divinity. 
The reason I asked is yeah. that, again, the global elite, they're convinced, you mentioned 2035 before, that by 2035, the first successful attempt to transfer one's personality to an alternative carrier will take place. And so they call this the epoch of cybernetic immortality. In other words, in one generation, bodies made of nanorobots can take any shape or rise alongside holographic bodies. And by 2045, which is a key point in many different cultures, the you know the Chinese culture, uh, we will see drastic changes in social structure. And the main priority of this development is what they call spiritual self-improvement. In other words, a new era dawns, the era of neo-humanity. And to most people, that may seem like some you know wacky uh, conspiracy theory, but you can extrapolate this towards the future. And again, all this information is readily available in texts and interviews. Sure, you sure. know, people such as Ray Kurzweil, uh, Klaus Schwab, Harari, Davos. Just go on their webpage. You know, World Economic Forum. It's all there in black and white. Yeah, well, this is the thing. It, it is no secret. They're very proud of what they believe is uh, is the. The future that they envision for us, they're very proud of uh, of the abilities to implement that future. And I, I think they honestly believe that they're doing something that will benefit uh, at least some people. The question is, what kind of a world do we do we want to live in? I think we can't answer that until we answer the most fundamental question. Who are we? Exactly. We are not, That's exactly we are, what I was thinking. Who yeah, are we're, we? We're, well, we are not the product of random mutations in lucky biology. Now, as a scientist, I scientifically, I cannot say who or what caused those mutations 200,000 years ago. What I can say is it appears to be some kind of an intervention. That's all I can say scientifically. Now, my, my personal opinion when I look at the evidence, I look at the cultural evidence from all the indigenous people. I look at the archaeological evidence that's coming to light. I look at the anthropological evidence. And now we look at the fossil evidence and the genetic evidence. All of it says that we are the product of some kind of an intelligent intervention. You know, the, the mutations that give us our humanness, uh, chromosome two, there's one gene that's called TBR1. It's responsible for 80% of the, the neocortex where we it's the neocortex that gives us empathy sympathy uh compassion the ability to self-regulate our biology when we choose other forms of life do it by instinct we can sit down in a moment and say in this moment i choose to strengthen my immune system i i choose to uh, em embark upon a, a journey of, of super learning no other form of life can do that it's all because of those mutations, and those mutations are not an accident. So when, and and we're only beginning to understand what that potential is. So when we look at modifying our biology, we're looking at modifying something that I believe was given to us 200,000 years ago that we're only beginning to understand. But there's another, there's another piece of this, Daniel, and it's really interesting. The Supreme Court, uh, I believe it's 2014, handed down a ruling on genetic modification uh, of life. And the question is, uh, does natural biology, natural DNA, uh, is a life form made of natural DNA given the freedoms guaranteed through the constitution, in this case, it was in America or, or any other country. And, and because the pharmaceutical industries are trying to, to patent DNA. And what the, uh, what the Supreme Court said is you cannot patent something that is natural. You cannot patent the natural DNA. However, if that DNA is modified in some way, you can patent the modification. So, if we are embarking on a journey where we modify our collective DNA, where it's being engineered, uh, so it's no longer natural DNA, there are legal implications, there are implications in terms of freedom, uh, and in terms of our rights as a, a form of life, if we are no longer natural DNA. And this comes right back to the transhuman 
uh, the whole trans transhuman idea. So, you know, you have to ask yourself who benefits from a society that looks like this, because it's, it's not the average person. You know, the average person isn't going to benefit from a society like this. If you kind of extrapolate, I'll go back in time to what, you know, to, to, to the roots of some of these ideas. The transhumanism itself isn't new. It's rooted in many ancient orders and the philosophy of eugenics. Sure. And at, at the heart of transhumanism, it represents this kind of an esoteric quest for godhood among certain circles of this elite connected to Freemasonry, occultism, science, technology, or in supposedly evolving superior being ethically replace lesser humans. And so this philosophy, you know, we're speaking of, of, of Avatar before, is portrayed in the blockbuster film Prometheus. I don't know if you saw that. but I have seen it many, I own it. <laughs> I've seen it many times, yeah. Because, the, so again, the idea of Prometheus, that's a great film. I liked it a lot. It's disturbing to a certain point if you understand the meaning of it. The, but the idea, I think, of Prometheus is at the core of, of, of many of these ancient civilizations, the ideas uh, uh, presented in the film, which is at the heart of Western secret societies. So you have the, uh, across the world, we'll see these early civilizations or their obsession with what they believe to be some kind of off-world influences. And we have from Nazca lines in South America to the pyramids in Egypt. We see artifacts with the testaments to early man's obsession, no? to all this off-world manipulation. And every ancient culture believed that they were communicated with men somewhere in the sky. And one could say that even that Prometheus is simply an imitator, art imitating life and putting a 21st century spin on the beliefs of this Dogon tribe in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I've spent much of my adult life. Uh, I was blessed in the 1980s to begin traveling and exploring ancient and indigenous societies that I'd studied when I was a kid. And every one that I've gone to, Daniel, every single society that I've gone to, from the, the monks and the nuns in Tibet to the, the yogis in India and the sadhus in Nepal and uh, all through the the Kurundaros and the, the Yucatan and the uh, Quechua in the Southern Andes and all through the American desert Southwest, all of them allow for a relationship with, uh, with beings uh, they call a family beyond this world. And it's an ongoing relationship. It's not an ancient relationship. It's a, a current relationship. So now, you know, the Western world, we're, we're in what's called disclosure, well, disclosure happened a long time ago uh, publicly. What I think people are waiting for is an acknowledgement on CNN or from uh, Moscow or Washington, D.C. of these relationships. That That's what they're calling disclosure. But the fact of that we have interacted with and that we have technology from, you know, other worlds uh, we have known for, for quite a while. So that's what I'm saying. The, the, this conversation isn't happening in a vacuum. So I'm, I'm just going to take us a, a, a little bit different direction. I had, um, uh, I have a number of friends who were working in an industry. They were, they're therapists uh, and they were working with uh, globally with what is called the abduction phenomenon. So people that have been, uh, they believe taken from this world alien abductions, you know, and they've been tested on, you know, or, or whatever it is that's happening. And when they, and, and then they have emotional problems from that. So they go to the, the therapists that, that specialize in this. So one of the first of all the different people, I mean, this was across different continents and from the 1960s all the way up through the 1990s, John Mack from Harvard University was, uh, was part of this before, before he died. And the common theme is when the people are taken, they will typically ask, why did you take me? You know, what is it that you want from me or why are you interested in me? And a couple of answers come up that are, I think, relevant to this conversation. One of them is that uh, a large number of the abductors, they say that, that we humans are at a crossroads in our evolution now that the the abductors were at a time in their history and they went down the path of technology they became 
machines more than biological beings, and they regret that decision. And they're warning us not to make that same mistake. They're saying, don't give your humanness away. Don't give your biology away. And then a, a lesser number of these, it was really interesting because the what they called UFOs, they weren't aliens from another world. They were us from our own future coming back saying that there was a time that humans made the choice to go the transhuman route. They became hybrid beings and they regret that decision. And they're asking us to, to not give our humanness away. Don't give they're our biology away. Reconsider and change our timeline. Did you see a series called uh, many years ago called Fringe? I did. Uh, absolutely. You you and I watch the same program as my you friend. And I, you and I watch the same program. Listen, I was going to say, look, we've been doing this for an hour and we're thinking of going for another half an hour. How about I propose something else? Let's find a time in the near future. Let's do another hour or, or another 10 hours because you and I have so much to talk about. Okay. Uh, I, you... I would I, I would be honored. And I think this is a very fertile conversation, fertile ground, because because it's happening right now, Daniel. This we're you exploring. Know, you and I are explorers. We're exploring ideas. You know, we're touching things which are there to be touched, feeling them, the frequencies. And uh, I think we're finding a common path. Again, you and I, we're thinking about the same things, the same movies, the same ideas. We understand things in a very similar way. And I think that's the idea, bringing this energy towards a, a, a particular objective. And I think if you have another time for another hour, I'd love to do another hour with you. And we have so much to talk about. Uh, you mean at another time? At another time, yeah. Another, another, another time, yes. I, I think... I think to close on on this one, what I want to live, leave our viewers with, you know, we cover a lot of ground. I think ultimately we are on a journey to find the, the best version of ourselves. What does it mean to be human? And how can we awaken our humanness in the, the healthiest way possible to become the best people and to create the best possible world? And I think ultimately every part of this conversation, we have to put it into that context. When we think we think about it from that way. I, I think it helps us to make good decisions in our lives and for our families. And to, Daniel, I appreciate humanity in the name of humanity. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you, your work, your lifetime of Likewise, research, your your Greg, passion, my brother, I've been a fan and I, of yours for many years before I even knew you personally. I've been reading and watching and your stuff over and over again, and 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 you know, admiring everything you've done. Thank you so much. Well, I, for Thank you. That's good for me to hear today. I look forward to our next and um, we'll arrange that sooner than later then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care, Greg. Thank you. Take care.